Hi, I'm Kelly Giordano with Newman's Own Foundation. In 1982, Paul Newman and his friend A.E. Hotchner had a single great salad dressing and a single great idea, that 100% of any profits made from Newman's Own products would be given away. Since 1982, Newman's Own Foundation has done just that, donating more than half a billion dollars to worthy charities around the globe. And Paul was an avid supporter of public television. He believed in the power of public television to inform, inspire, and build stronger communities. And now, we're excited to announce a special Newman's Own Foundation challenge just for NJTV. Through the entire month of March, Newman's Own Foundation will match your contribution dollar for dollar up to $25,000. So call or go online right now and we can double your donation. Any contribution, large or small, will help NJTV meet this challenge. Together we can support the essential and inspiring programming on New Jersey Public Television. Thank you. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, lawmakers hear from the man at the center of rape allegations. Who hired Al Alvarez, the former Murphy staffer accused of sexually assaulting Katie Brennan? Alvarez spent hours testifying about that today. A bombshell story calls into question Katie Brennan's testimony. What impact will it have on the select committee's hearings? Days after Governor Murphy delivers his budget address, Senate President Sweeney continues his Path to Progress tour and the reforms he's pushing with it. And the state's top leaders have apparently settled their differences over recreational weed. How soon might people legally light up? Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online after weeks of hearings into who hired Al Alvarez, the former Murphy staffer accused of rape. Lawmakers on the Select Oversight Committee have finally heard from him directly. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was there. Al Alvarez arrived amid a scrum of media and a swirl of news about his alleged sexual assault of Katie Brennan during the campaign. Tests showed DNA from the case reportedly was not his, according to prosecutors' files obtained by his lawyer and published by Politico. Alvarez adamantly denied Brennan's allegations. These false allegations have devastated my career and have brought an emotional toll by myself and my loved ones. And it was Alvarez's career with the Murphy administration that occupied a day of testimony, which often conflicted with the record. After repeated questions, we still don't know who precisely hired Al Alvarez for his $140,000 a year job at the school's development authority. He's not sure either. Who hired you? I can't tell you that I know who specifically said you're hired. I just uh, can tell you honestly that I know that I expressed my interest there and no one objected to me going there. Alvarez said that after Phil Murphy's election, he discussed the administration job he wanted with Murphy's chief of staff, Pete Camerano, and with transition team head, Jose Lozano. He advised me that uh, the SDA um, CEO position was not going to be available, that Mr. McKenna was going to stay. Uh, but the chief of staff position was available, and would I be interested in that? And I said yes. Alvarez explained he talked to the SDA's chief, Charlie McKenna, about the new job and asserted nothing would have happened without the approval of Camerano and Murphy's chief counsel, Matt Platkin. All of these decisions and recommendations that we would make on potential hires had to go through Mr. Camerano and Mr. Platkin. And Mr. Lozano. Do you agree with Mr. Lozano's statement that it's a safe assumption that either one of those two, either one of those two, meaning Platkin or Camerano, approved your employment at the SDA? Yes. So, I mean, we're making progress. 
Here's the rub. Platkin, Camerano, and Lozano have all previously testified and all denied actually hiring Alvarez. Lozano's also testified they never discussed salaries. Moreover, after Katie Brennan again complained about Alvarez to Murphy's front office in March, Camerano said he sternly directed Alvarez to leave. But that's not what Alvarez heard. What you're understanding the thrust of Mr. Camerano's message was to you. My understanding, my takeaway was that it was not a direction. I came away feeling that he was making it clear he would prefer that I leave state government. Alvarez said he never really looked for another job until June. That's when Brennan emailed the governor and Charlie McKenna subsequently told Alvarez to leave state employment, but without setting a deadline. He said Platkin did agree to help him find another job, but Platkin doesn't recall that. In August, while under orders to leave, Alvarez actually scored a $30,000 raise. He finally resigned October 2nd after the Wall Street Journal called him about their impending story on Brennan's accusations, and the Murphy administration said it flatly ordered him to resign or be fired. There was no formalizing of the hiring process. And if there had been a paper trail, a memorialization of the process, then we would be able to answer that question. Select Oversight Committee members said they'll review testimony, especially the discrepancies, and might recall witnesses as they prepare a final report. At the State House in Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Even if no new light was shed on who hired Alvarez, that explosive report did shed new light on a Murphy staffer's allegations of sexual assault. Senior correspondent David Cruz looks at that. I stand by my previous statement that I have been falsely accused. The sexual contact between myself and Ms. Brennan was consensual. After months of testimony that painted a sinister picture of a predator who attacked an unsuspecting co-worker, Al Alvarez and his attorney attempted to present an alternative narrative. A day after an explosive story from Politico cast doubt on Katie Brennan's version of events. This tape obtained from Politico from Alvarez's attorneys represents his first public account of the events. I didn't get any impression that it was uncomfortable for her, that, that, that we were doing anything um, inappropriate um, sexually. Um, so, no, it, it was all just consensual touching and, and feeling. Citing the files obtained from Alvarez's defense team, the political story says Brennan failed to tell the select committee that DNA evidence from a rape kit did not match Alvarez and that she failed to disclose to them that her attorneys had threatened to sue Alvarez for $1.5 million, disclosing only the counteroffer from Alvarez's attorney. Alvarez called her testimony misleading. Committee members said today none of this was relevant to their hearings. We said from the very beginning that we were not empowered nor did we plan to investigate what actually happened that night. I don't see anything that would change that empowerment or lack thereof, I should say. Brennan's testimony to prosecutors is consistent with her statements made before the committee. And I said, like, why are you doing this? You know, like, stop doing, why are you doing this? And I got, like, very clinical about it. I even said it was like, sort of out of body at that point, you know, like, this is actually happening. Like, this is crazy. This is happening to me. And, and I said, I, I literally uttered the phrase, this is not consensual. But supporters of Alvarez say his version of the encounter should call into question the rationale for this committee's formation. It's really down to he said, she said at this point. And, you know, everyone who testified originally said she had great credibility. And, you know, so now we're hearing from Mr. Alvarez. But the, the committee itself has been charged with looking into what we, I just said, into the hiring practices, you know, and into the EEO compliance during the tra uh, campaign transition and early in the administration. And I think that's what we're looking into. At an event this morning, the governor steered clear of both the political story and the committee's proceedings. We must respect the criminal justice process. We cannot allow, as I've said all along, any, um, any speck of political interference. Neither what Alvarez said or what Brennan said about the events of April 2017 will have any bearing on what comes out of this committee, say its members. But in the court of public opinion, at least, Al Alvarez has finally had his day. In Trenton, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News.
Lawmakers will have final say, but the top three have resolved the last big hurdle that's held up the legalization of recreational marijuana. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron is here with details. Michael? Mary Alice, after a year of negotiating, the governor, the Senate president, and the assembly speaker finally have a marijuana legalization package they agree on. Murphy made the announcement this morning. He said the social justice ramifications have been his driving motivation, but he also touted the economic benefits. The billions of dollars in, in the economic reality I refer to is factual if you look at other states that have done this. So if you look at the impact on Colorado or Massachusetts, to pick two examples I've cited recently, it's thousands of jobs and billions of dollars of economic activity. The bill sets the state tax on marijuana sales at $42, ounce, $42 per ounce. Total cost of an ounce is usually about $400, Murphy said. Municipalities can tack on a tax of 1% if they are home to a wholesaler, 2% if they are home to a grower, and 3% if they are home to a dispensary. The bill sets up a five-person cannabis regulatory commission, three appointed by the governor, two more by him upon the recommendation of the Senate president and the speaker. It allows for a speedy expungement of prior low-level possession convictions, and it creates incentives for minority, women, and low-income-owned businesses. Right now, the votes are not all there to pass it, as Senator Sweeney acknowledged last night. Our goal is March 25th because, and right now, I couldn't tell you I had 21 votes or 41 votes. All I know is that the leadership, the governor, myself, the speaker are in agreement. And now it's time to, to ratchet up the votes to get it passed. Uh, if it passes, I wouldn't see adult use pass before, pass before, I mean, actually imp implementation until the end of the year because it takes time to get get the regulations in place and to ensure that we have an industry that's safe and, you know, is guarded against abuse. Sources say the effort is still three to five votes short in the Senate and five to eight votes short in the Assembly. The leaders say they'll be working to gather those votes over the next two weeks. It won't be easy, although a Senate source says those votes are, quote, eminently gettable. Mary Alice? Thank you, Michael. Gaming revenues are at stake. Rhonda Scheffler is here with all the day's business news. Rhonda? Mary Alice, millions of dollars in state tax revenue could be lost due to a threat against New Jersey's growing Internet gaming industry. Attorney General Gerbier Graywall says that threat is a recent U.S. Department of Justice decision to reinterpret the Wire Act, which regulates certain types of betting, to now include online gaming. Graywell supporting New Hampshire's legal effort to invalidate that new interpretation. Graywell contends New Jersey might be forced to end its internet gaming industry and the financial loss to the state would be substantial. He says New Jersey could lose $60 million in tax revenue a year, as well as hundreds of jobs. Graywall also alleges that casino executive Sheldon Adelson lobbied for the reinterpretation of the act because his casinos could lose profits due to online gambling. New Jersey's Economic Development Authority continues to hand out millions of dollars in tax incentives to businesses, even as Governor Murphy pushes to sunset the Grow New Jersey program at the end of the current fiscal year. Today, the EDA awarded a total of $24 million in multi-year incentives to three companies, Key Food Stores, Legend Biotech, and Singer NY. Could the Port Authority take over Atlantic City International Airport? The Press of Atlantic City is reporting State Senate President Steve Sweeney wants the agency to take over the airport in order to expand flights. The airport is currently run by the South Jersey Transportation Authority, but the Port Authority already provides some management operations. Talks on this possibility reportedly are in the early stages. Finally, New Jersey's marijuana deal was big news on Wall Street, where stocks of marijuana companies rallied today. But the overall market closed mixed. The Dow dropped 96 points. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by Junior Achievement of New Jersey, announcing its annual Business Hall of Fame dinner on April 11th at the Hyatt Regency in New Brunswick. Event details at janj.org.
President Trump's budget for 2020 contains no funding for the Gateway Project and cuts funding for Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, leaving U.S. Senators from New Jersey and New York working on ways to start the Portal Bridge Replacement Project without waiting for Trump administration sign-off. They say they're working on legislation that would allow the states to advance the federal share of the project with a guarantee they'd be repaid once the project does get final approval. A major portion of the state's budget is devoted to funding public worker pensions, which the state Senate president says is fueling a budget crisis. Steve Sweeney's pitching reforms to the system at a town hall in Burlington County tonight, but he's already finding it a very tough sell. Brianna Vernozzi reports. We're not changing pensions for anyone that's vested. We're not changing them, we're not touching them. So you can say it all you want, you can accuse us of doing that all you want, but that's not what's in the report. But that is the message hundreds of public workers came ready to contest at Senator Steve Sweeney's latest town hall, continuing his Path to Progress tour at Monmouth University, calling for more savings, working to drum up support for policy reforms he says will help fix the state's dire money problems. We can ignore this and we can blame everyone and we can tax everything and raise all these taxes. We're going to have to raise taxes $8 billion when the pension system goes broke. And it's coming. The linchpin of his plan, developed by a bipartisan work group of academics and policy experts, is major structural changes to the current pension and benefit system, shifting public workers to a less costly hybrid savings plan and moving health coverage from the current platinum level to gold, a proposal experts estimate could save taxpayers $1.4 billion over the next four years. My question is, as a Democrat, yeah. How could you support that? Yes. Tom Wolf, Democrat governor, did exactly that in Pennsylvania. The governor of New Hampshire did exactly the same thing because of not, not by want, not because they desired to do this, because of because they had to be done. There is no way to solve our problem without dealing with those things. And those folks that say, oh, they paid their fair share and everything else. It's true. Uh, the taxpayers have paid their fair share as well. Both have been sold. Well, bo both, uh, I got it. I understand the distinction, guys. We're all taxpayers. Public workers are taxpayers, too. I got it. You can say that over and over again. But the bottom line is if we don't solve this, the people that are going to suffer most are public workers. Sweeney gave credit to Governor Murphy for revving up the state's pension payment and funding for school aid, but called for more aggressive steps, adding New Jersey's facing a $4 billion deficit by 2023 without it. This crowd, though, isn't convinced the lawmaker won't come knocking again for more. I have a hard time believing it. Um, both of my parents retired with full pensions. Both of them have seen um, the loss of their cost of living increases. Um, they have both seen changes to their health plans. If it doesn't get done today, we have tomorrow. I'm not walking away from this. It has to be fixed. Senator Sweeney says the rest of his proposed reforms will be drafted by April. The budget battle, though, is likely to take quite a bit longer. In Long Branch, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Another giant step in space for Jersey science students. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Ocean City, where Ocean City High School students will be testing the effect of microgravity on the gender and hatch rate of brine shrimp to learn if they can be a sustainable, renewable food source in space. The experiment's one of only 41 scheduled to be aboard a SpaceX craft when it's launched to the International Space Station July 8th. Next to Vineland, where the first dog trained to protect South Jersey high school students against active shooters has graduated from Atlantic County's Police Canine Academy, the two-year-old Dutch Shepherd is named Meadow. In honor of Meadow Pollock, she was one of 17 who died in a hail of gunfire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High, using her body to shield another. Finally, Cherry Hill, where Cherry Hill East Theater Director is taking his final curtain call after 42 years. Tom Weaver has won national honors from Musical Theater International, launched A-list actors and writers and producers, and brought Shakespeare and Lloyd Webber to life on stage. This year's elaborate production of Fiddler on the Roof is Mr. Weaver's swan song, the one that goes, sunrise, sunset, swiftly fly the years. And that's our Garden State Express for Tuesday, March 12th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off.
In the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's inventory of toxins released per square mile, New Jersey ranks 13th out of 56 states and territories it regulates, and the impact of air pollutants falls hardest on those least able to escape it. Joanna Gagas has our report. The numbers are lower, but it hardly feels like good news. Six million pounds of toxic chemicals released into New Jersey's air and water in 2017, according to a new EPA report. About 15 years ago, it was as high as 20 million pounds a year, but that's not much of a consolation for residents who live near one of New Jersey's worst polluters, the Phillips 66 Bayway Refinery in Linden. As soon as you step in this area, you notice the smell, and it is concerning. I have an 11-year-old, and I do have concerns because you don't know what it is. And he'd be concerned sometimes. He'll look up and say, Mom, something's on fire. And we're like, no, those are just the chemicals burning over there. Cherry Harris says this neighborhood doesn't have the capacity to fight for cleaner air. We live in a very low-income neighborhood, so we're advocating for food and shelter and everything else. I don't believe we can get to the point where we're able to advocate for the smells or the chemicals that are released in the air. The Bayway refinery contributes nearly half of New Jersey's toxic emissions. Paulsboro Refining Company in Gloucester County and Camorra's Chamber Works in Salem County are next in line, according to the report. And the communities around them are suffering, says environmentalist Jeff Tittle. Those communities are still choking on all the toxic chemicals in the environment. And we see it because we see that in a lot of those communities, like in Newark, more than a third of the children have asthma. Uh, we see it with high cancer rates in, along that corridor in certain areas as well. Some of the most harmful chemicals include nitrate compounds that can cause cancer in humans and kill marine life. Some can cause brain damage, hearing and vision loss, dizziness and loss of muscle control, and damage to the respiratory system. New Jersey ranks among the worst states in the nation for toxic releases per square mile. And nationally, deregulation by the Trump administration has rolled back restrictions on greenhouse gas emissions. Since Governor Murphy took office, clean energy has been a priority of his administration. I think what the governor is doing, promoting renewable energy is good. Building offshore windmills is, is critical to help reduce pollution, providing that we also make sure that we stop some of these power plants that are being proposed right now that are going to increase the greenhouse gases in New Jersey by about 30 percent. The state has filed over a dozen environmental justice lawsuits, cases that address pollution that disproportionately affects minority and low-income communities. And just last week, Attorney General Gerbeer Graywall brought suit once again against ExxonMobil. You may remember the state settled with ExxonMobil for $225 million in 2015. The decision was controversial because the $225 million was a fraction of the original $8.9 billion the state was seeking. In his first budget, Murphy allocated just $50 million to the Clean Energy Fund, a move that drew criticism from environmentalists. We would like to see all the clean energy funds go for clean energy and because it helps reduce a lot of pollution and creates jobs. The first draft of Governor Murphy's budget does allocate more money to the clean energy fund than he did last year, but at this stage in the budget process, it's just too early to know where those numbers will end up. In Trenton, Joanna Gagas, NJTV News. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. An agreement to legalize adult use marijuana would impose a tax of $42 per ounce. Pew Charitable Trust says New Jersey's is the worst funded public employee retirement system in the country. The state's current lawsuit against ExxonMobil is its fifth natural resources damages case since January 2018. And Atlantic City International Airport was originally established in 1942 as a naval air station. If there's someone you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, today's hearing brings the School Development Authority's hiring practices 
under a microscope. And NJ Spotlight drills into how much students in your local schools learned last year. You can sign up for their daily newsletter. Go to njspotlight.com and click on NJ Spotlight Newsletters. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. Independent College Fund of New Jersey, in partnership with McCarter and English, providing legal strategies to help drive our clients' businesses forward for 175 years. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.